Hello and welcome to Triage, Timely Conversations for Healthcare Professionals, a podcast created and produced by KNL Gates. Each episode is designed to highlight important developments in health law and analyze the impact on our clients and friends of the firm. We hope you enjoy this podcast. Hello, this afternoon, we're going to talk a little bit about employment law and the healthcare sector and where they tend to interact and meet by discussing the year in review of 2020 and some developments that will impact both industries, both sectors in 2021. I'm Jackie Hoffman. I'm a partner in the Dallas office and a member of the healthcare and FDA group. And I have the distinct privilege this afternoon of visiting with and speaking with my colleague, Spencer Hamer, from the Labor and Employment and Workplace Group, who has authored the year in review that's been published by the firm. And to have the chance to talk about some of the issues that he's highlighted in his look back and his forecast for 2021. Spencer? Uh, thank you, Jackie. Yeah, this was a very active year with COVID-19, uh, certainly in employment law, but also with the interaction into the healthcare industry in a variety of ways. So we saw activity on a variety of fronts, including whistleblower claims, um, claims that have been brought by family members against the employers of their family members. We've seen sort of a preview of how things might change under the Biden administration with respect to certain wage hour issues. We've continued to look at issues in terms of screening, and now we're looking at vaccination related issues, non compete agreements, just a variety of things have happened and certainly continues to be active in, uh, in the intersection of employment and healthcare. So, Spencer, when we look back to when a lot of this started as part of the year in review and how it plays into 2021, can we go back to talking a little bit about the early days of screening and testing employees, different kinds of employees and workplace environments that were necessitating looking at screening? As to your point, we're now at the age of um, vaccination, but we continue to have those requirements to ensure workplace safety. And if you can talk a little bit about how that's developed over time and where we are today in trying to implement those programs and keep those um, workplace environments safe for employees. Yeah, at the beginning of COVID, there was a lot of uncertainty around this. And we were certainly getting many calls and questions from clients on the screening related issues. You know, we did have some guidance from the EEOC that had uh, been in place years ago during a prior issue relating to H1N1. And uh, so there was some original guidance there that we could look back at at the very, very beginning. And then the EEOC gave us some additional guidance sort of building on that and eventually kind of came to the conclusion that everybody was sort of expecting, which is that you can do the screening for COVID-19. You can require employees to be screened uh, when they're coming in, for example, with a temperature check. And then the, the regulations expanded and the guidance from the EEOC to, to talk about testing. And that's something that employers can do as well in terms of keeping the workplace safe without necessarily running afoul of the anti-discrimination laws. However, the same principles apply with respect to the ADA, the Americans with Disabilities Act, in terms of making sure that your screening is job-related and consistent with business necessity and designed to prevent employees from presenting a direct threat to the health and safety of themselves or others in the workplace. So we always have to work under those overarching principles. And the EEOC has some helpful guidance on their website to go to go into this. But basically, you need to be making sure that you're following applicable, not just the EEOC sort of high level guidance, but obviously all the standards from the public health authorities. And that includes the CDC, local uh, health authority as well, and in whatever particular state employers operating. And those vary. Uh, so you can't just, it's not just a one size fits all situation. Just for example, in California, we have new regulations that address uh, testing and specifically say you cannot require a test for the employee to return to the workplace after the employee has been exposed to coronavirus. So you're going to have to look at the individual states as well. But from a very high level view, the EEOC is not saying that by testing and or screening, employees for coming into the workplace with coronavirus, you're per se violating the ADA. Now, there's been a lot of discussion about what about accommodation for disabled employees and or uh, religious accommodations. And so while we can't really go into all the nuances of that today on this podcast, employers just need to be aware that reasonable accommodation analysis may need to be conducted 
for a disability or a religious belief of the employee. So that is sort of an overview. Spencer, I know that a lot of the questions we're getting in the healthcare space is the screening protocols, the test protocols, and frankly, next, the vaccine protocols are producing a lot of information, some of which people are concerned is protected by you know, sort of the plethora of privacy structures we've got in place, whether it's HIPAA-protected information, is this employment-related, Is does um, ADA type of information come up? You talked a little bit about the need for accommodations, whether it's to be in the workplace, being screened, whether it is to get a vaccine. Maybe we can talk a little bit about what these two areas of activity, whether it's screening or whether it's now vaccination, how they're producing information and what employers um, need to be thinking about in terms of where that information that is sometimes very personal and protected even by state confidentiality laws, where it lives and where it gets protected and what the responsibility is as they need to keep that concern in the back of their minds as they're also worried about safe workplace issues. Employers need to make sure that whatever information they're gathering is kept segregated from other personnel file records, just sort of as a standard obligation for employee privacy. As I mentioned, I know that on the healthcare side, we've talked to a lot of clients about screening information like temperature is not necessarily HIPAA protected information. But as you go along through information gathering, whether it is a product of screening and testing or again, vaccination, as information gets shared between employee and employers and sometimes the benefit programs in which the employer is participating, um, there is the risk that the employer might find itself responsible for some HIPAA protected information and needs to be sensitive to that and take the appropriate measures to protect the information, which to your point is a little bit different than the privacy that it attaches to the information as it's simply being private and belonging to the employee. And that those considerations both might require protection, but not necessarily the same ones. And that um, those important considerations to keep in mind as this body of information grows with the long life of screening and now vaccination programs. So with that in mind, can we talk a little bit about the current guidance on vaccinations, maybe a little bit about the mandatory or not mandatory nature of it, the EEOC guidance on vaccinations as it's starting to come about? And, you know, again, we've started to touch on the use and retention of the vaccine information itself. Right, right. So we have some new guidance from the EEOC on vaccination. It was issued in December 2020. And they updated their guidance on COVID-19 vaccination requirements and how that intersects with uh, employee rights under the Americans with Disabilities Act and uh, Title VII as well. So essentially, the ADA, according to the EEOC, the ADA does permit employers to use a qualification standard, such as a vaccination requirement, that includes a, quote, requirement that an individual shall not pose a direct threat to the health or safety of individuals in the workplace, close quote. And then to determine a direct threat exists, you have to go through an individualized assessment of the employee that's a multi-factored analysis. And then you have to look at whether, if you have an unvaccinated employee who poses a direct threat, whether any uh, reasonable accommodation can be provided absent undue hardship that would um, eliminate or reduce the risk. And ultimately, if you go through that whole process and you determine um, that accommodation cannot be made, then the employee can be excluded from the workplace. But that is not necessarily the end of the issue. You need to be very careful before you take any adverse action against the employee. And you also have to look at whether any particular local or state laws apply that might lead to a different conclusion. But basically, the EEOC is saying that with respect to a disability analysis, it is sort of the standard disability analysis that we've that we've done in the past uh, for direct threat. So the doors are open for employers to require a vaccine, but they but there's an asterisk on that that they really need to do that very cautiously and working with counsel to make sure there's um, proper accommodations are given and uh, the analysis is done. A similar analysis is going to apply to a, an employee's sincerely held religious belief. Once again, you've got to look at whether the employer can provide some type of reasonable accommodation uh, for the religious belief, practice, or observance, um, unless it would pose an undue hardship. And uh, employers need to keep in mind that religious practice or belief is a very broad standard, and the U.S. Supreme Court has looked at this in the past. And so it, it doesn't necessarily have to be a formal religion as, as is sort of you know normally understood. Uh, it can be a very broad 
broad standard where it's basically something that is sincerely held by the employee. I was just going to ask, I mean, because you referenced in both whether it's a, an ADA accommodation or accommodation for a religious belief, I was curious whether you're seeing, even if it's anecdotally, changes in the expectation or ability to provide accommodations because business workplaces that have not historically been virtual have a much more significant material virtual component than they have in the past. And is that being used or are you seeing that driving the ability of employers to accommodate or frankly, the requests from employees. And I know that we're talking very specifically about the healthcare industry today a bit and healthcare employers. And is that, and if that is a trend, is is sort of the healthcare environment somewhat exempt from it because the provision of care and those settings don't lend themselves to a virtual accommodation? Yeah, I mean, that's right. In other industries, we've certainly seen a lot of these considerations aren't applying because you've got a remote workforce. And and so it really hasn't been an issue in industries where they've been able to go entirely remote or as much of an issue as for other industries. But certainly within healthcare, obviously, remote work is not really applying. So these issues are more in the forefront, which is why healthcare industry employers really need to be in tune with the regulations in terms of what can you require when an employee comes back and presents some type of disability issue and or religious issue. We have seen, uh, we've seen a fair amount of case law already developed in the healthcare industry on vaccinations. Uh, This was pre-COVID-19. And if you actually go back and look at some of the prior um, years that we've done on this podcast, we've addressed this as well. So that's our prior materials that the firm has done uh, for the healthcare industry. So there's already sort of a, a body of law that's been evolving on what do you do with a worker in the healthcare setting who has a sincerely held religious belief about a vaccine? And so um, there's uh, there's a very nuanced analysis that needs to go on. And employers that um, the employers sort of uh, that, that have had trouble with it in the courts are the ones that uh, from the fact pattern that's been presented aren't really thinking through the accommodation type issue and and not really giving enough analysis either ahead of time with maybe they had a policy that was just not flexible enough and not just giving not giving thought to how to deal with the situation in advance. So what happens is when the employee then presents the issue, the employer and or the managers who are dealing with it on the front lines aren't ready to uh, to handle that in, in the moment. So our recommendation is you need to think that through. If you're in the healthcare industry, you need to think through in advance with policy development and the training of your managers of how are you going to handle these situations as they arise. It's really interesting because as the rest of us struggle with something that is really new, your space has already dealt with this, to your point, with prior illnesses with the flu on an annual basis. And it sounds as if there's already a lot of guidance, um, at least in, in that space, that is informative and has forecasted a bit over the past year where we've, where we've ended up. In light of that, what have you seen in the past in terms of what we're heading into now with post-vaccine considerations how workers' compensation might relate or be implicated when an employee participates in a workplace vaccine program and has some sort of debilitating reaction or unexpected reaction. What does that start to look like as more and more of these programs roll out? We'll have to watch that and see. We haven't really seen too many cases coming up in that regard, but just will say sort of broad brush. I mean, those claims are typically, you know, obviously anything that arises out of the workplace setting that results in employee injury is generally going to be preempted by the workers' compensation under the various state law workers' compensation frameworks that are out there. So that is generally how it's going to be handled. To get outside the workers' compensation preemption, there has to be some, um, basically some very severe sort of knowledgeable bad act on the part of the employer alleged by the employee to try to get out of that. But that could transition well into the other topic that we did have in our, our annual update on this, which is the uh, the family member claims that we started to see in, in 2020. So uh, there was a lot of concern at the beginning of COVID as to what was going to happen to employers' claims by employees. Would they be preempted by workers' comp? And sort of uh, as time went on, we started to a consensus was sort of built up that, yes, those claims would typically be preempted. And then various states 
such as California, enacted legislation on this issue to, to talk about when would there be a presumption that COVID was contracted in the workplace, et cetera. But setting aside sort of that preemption issue, what we started to see was claims from family members of the employees who say that uh, they contracted COVID because the employee was not properly protected in the workplace by the employer, and therefore the employee brought COVID-19 home and exposed a family member who then caught it. So these claims are starting to be filed, working their way through the courts. We're going to have to watch and see what happens with them um, and whether there's any sort of trend that develops in terms of how those are handled. Obviously, various defenses can be raised to these types of claims in terms of how did the employee, how can they prove that it came necessarily from the family member and drawing that back to the workplace and then tying it into what the employer did or didn't do. But nevertheless, setting that aside, I mean, the employers should be, employers and particularly in the healthcare space should be cognizant of and complying with any and all applicable guidance from public health authorities, including the CDC uh, and their local departments of public health, making sure their policies are fully updated, making sure their managers and employees are trained. And um, we've talked about throughout the pandemic, the importance of constant and regular communication to your employees about what you're doing to comply with these regulations, not just doing it and just sort of leaving it for the employees to figure out whether you've done it, but actually doing it and doing it and then communicating to them and having a resource uh, for them to go to a point person with any particular questions, concerns, complaints, et cetera. So is that the area I know you alluded to this being along with the family claims, kind of the, the world or the breadth of potential whistleblower cases? Is that the issue that drives the whistleblowers that sort of a, a determined or deliberate defiance of guidance or regulations on the part of employers that are leading to those claims? Is that sort of the, the genesis of some of the whistleblower activity that you're seeing as an alternative to the family claims since the since the workers' comp area seems to preempt the worker themselves from otherwise pursuing a claim? Yeah, definitely. And I, I did want to point out something that was in our article, which was that the Department of Labor's Office of Inspector General issued um, a finding that the number of occupational safety and health whistleblower claims, 39% of which were directly related to COVID-19, increased by 30% between February and May 2020 as compared to the same period the year prior. So the numbers just show it right there. And we were focusing early on in the pandemic on the whistleblower issue. Whistleblowing is already one of the more common reasons for employees to be bringing claims. Even pre-COVID, retaliation has, has been a growing area of claims for, for many years now. And uh, this simply just adds to it, obviously, with the lawsuits we've already started to see and the statistics just quoted. So employers need to be obviously aware of this risk. They need to have strong policies in place that, that allow employees to come forward, that encourage employees to come forward with questions, concerns, issues. The employees need to know who is the point person who receives these complaints. The employees need to feel comfortable that if they make these complaints, they're not going to be retaliated against, not just having a policy in place, but actually the culture of the employer itself has to be open and accommodating to receiving these complaints. And that requires, in addition to the written policy, real training where you're sitting down with your managers and explaining to them the importance of this, doing the, the hard work of, of really going beyond on the piece of paper in your employee handbook or document. Uh, that's where you can make a difference as an employer. And then, you know, welcoming these complaints so that viewing them as an opportunity to, to make a change if necessary. And then you've got to get back to the employee, let them know what you did. Obviously, all this needs to be documented up so that if and when you experience one of these claims, the employer can show not only was the policy in place, not only was the training done, but and that's all well and good. But then you have to go further and say, and when the complaint came in, these are all the steps we took. This is how we responded to the employee. Here's the documentation of everything. If a change was reasonably necessary, we made that change. And here's the documentation showing that that change occurred. Nothing's wrong. That's fine. You address that and explain what's been done and why nothing's wrong. But if something's wrong, it's the opportunity to rectify that and take appropriate action and document all that up. Spencer, that's really interesting because we've really gotten to a point in the conversation where we're talking about well-established ways of addressing and managing issues in the workplace. And that history of being a well-established sort of protocol or pattern fits well in the COVID environment, but it's a great 
opening our opportunity to talk about some things that are going on that are other than just COVID, particularly as, you know, optimistically, the vaccine may enable everyone to start to consider and look at some other things that are happening in this area of the law. So I thought maybe we'd talk about, um, with the new administration, some of the issues that tend to get new breath or, or life to them um, with the start of a new a new administration. And one of those areas is um, the independent contractor classification, which I know is, has been an area of a trending area. And one of the things that you addressed in the article and thought maybe this would be a good time to talk a little bit, a little bit about some of that activity. Yeah, so independent contractors is um, sort of a hot topic. We're going to look to see whether the Department of Labor under the Biden administration starts to look at um, what some of the states have been doing and trending. So, for example, in California, with the ABC test being enacted and codified into law recently for contractor status, joining just a few other states that are using the ABC test for purposes of wage and hour and classification of contractors, but just to, just to give it a broad brush overview, the ABC test basically narrows down the traditional common law factors into three factors for contractor status. Uh, one being under the ABC test, if any of these factors are not met, the employee will be deemed, the worker will be deemed an employee. So factor A would be the employer does not control or direct the performance of the work. Factor B would be the work is performed outside the usual course of business of the hiring entity. And factor C is, does the worker ordinarily perform the same work as part of an independently established trade, occupation, or business? That's sort of a high-level summary of what California is doing, and it has really changed the landscape. Originally, it was focused more on the gig economy in terms of the public debate, but the legislature took action and adopted this with respect to the entire California economy subject to certain carve-outs that, that have been made and exceptions. So the question is, is this going to trend into the federal federal approach, and are we going to see this happen? We'll have to watch and see, but I think it's something that uh, employers need to be aware of. Certainly in the healthcare industry, there's independent contractors have regularly been used, uh, obviously at the position level, but also for other providers and mid-levels as well. So this is going to be a trend to watch. I think that's a really interesting point. A lot of people, maybe outside of the healthcare industry, don't often think of physicians as being in the position of being an independent contractor. One of the things that I know you've written on in the last couple of years is um, the issue of states that are starting to address in a more deliberate way, regulate non-compete provisions in arrangements with physicians. Yeah, and just to clarify, I mean, I, I think if it is looked at at the federal level in terms of the contractor status, I think it's reasonable to expect that physicians would probably get an exemption like they have in California. But so it would be really more of a focus on other positions, the mid-level type positions um, for, for the contractor issues in the healthcare industry. But yes, with respect to the, um, the non-competes, we are seeing a growing number of states restricting or prohibiting the use of non-competition agreements for physicians. Indiana, as we pointed out in our most recent alert, is one of the states that has now joined this growing list of other states that, that are getting uh, involved in this area where they're enacting various types of statutes restricting the ability to put non-competes on physicians. Employers in the healthcare industry need to look at their particular jurisdiction. The days of just putting out a blanket type non-compete and say, well, let's use this in all the states, that's really not going to work for healthcare industry employers. You need to check on the variety of states that have these um, before rolling out um, some type of physician non-compete because all the state statutes are, are going to vary in their, their nuanced requirements. You need to make sure you're complying with the, the law of the applicable state on your physician non-compete. But it's interesting because I know in certain states, and I know that this has happened here in Texas a bit, is that historically you had to rely on the case law in your area to figure out whether that non-compete was going to be upheld or, or really swept away in its entirety. And one of the interesting things, particularly in the discussion about Indiana, is it gives you some very specific direction on if you're trying to have one or if you're trying to defeat one, exactly what the elements are. And that's that's a little bit of a different trend than, than the historic outgrowth of how to, how to battle or enforce a, a non-compete in a physician arrangement. Yeah, I mean, it's a good point. I mean, on the as we talk about in our article, I mean, one of the factors in Indiana now is that the physician has to be allowed to um, purchase a, quote, complete and final release from the non-compete at a reasonable price, close quote. So, you know, so what's the reasonable price going to be? How is this all going to get worked out? I mean, I think it's a good example of you've really got to do your homework now on these physician non-competes. It's not like I don't know, 15 years ago where we really just didn't weren't really dealing with this uh, at, at the level we are now. 
Right. And often those were stripped away because for that argument exactly, which was that there wasn't consideration built into the arrangement to support that um, the the impact of the non-compete. So it's a really interesting thing to see how some of these issues are, are in fact getting codified. I thought while we had a few minutes left, maybe we could talk about um, some interesting topics that are making their way into both the health arena and the workplace. And, and one of those is um, an issue you identified in your article where racism is really being treated as a public health threat in communities in the workplace. And that organizations like the AMA are starting to get involved in providing guidance on what that looks like, how to address it, and how to treat what have been historically sort of public policy issues as health threats in the communities and in the workplace and how to address it. In November 2020, the American Medical Association basically took a step that was designed to address the impact of systemic, cultural, and interpersonal racism on the health of people of color by passing a resolution recognizing racism as a public health threat and uh, providing a plan to mitigate its effects. And the AMA uh, resolution has set forth uh, several factors for healthcare employers to be cognizant of, and it's quite detailed. So I would just suggest that employers in the healthcare space look at our article and, and walk through those factors in terms of how they are currently operating to make sure they're in line with what the AMA resolution sets forth. But just to touch on sort of a high level of these, there are encouraging government agencies and NGOs to increase funding for research and to epidemiology of risks and damages related to racism, um, encouraging development, implementation, and evaluation of uh, medical education programs to address racism. They have directed the AMA to identify a set of current best practices for uh, healthcare institutions on racism, supporting ending the practice of using race as a proxy for biology or genetics in medical education, research, and clinical practice. They've directed the AMA to collaborate with stakeholders and experts to develop recommendations on how to interpret and improve clinical algorithms that currently include race-based corrective factors. And they have instructed the AMA to support research that promotes anti-racist strategies to mitigate algorithmic bias in medicine. I wanted to take a minute before we conclude also to talk about some trends that are maybe the outgrowth of COVID, but that may have longer legs or longer life beyond the public health emergency. And one of those is the use of telemedicine. Historically, you know, establishing a serious health condition, whether it's for ADA purposes to demonstrate the health condition or the accommodation that might be needed, required in-person visits. And with the growth of telemedicine and some of the federal waivers that have allowed telemedicine visits to substitute for in-person, I thought maybe we could talk a little bit about the use of telemedicine as equivalent and whether there's any expectation that tools like these remote visits might have sort of some staying power that goes beyond the public health emergency for employers. Yeah, I mean, the wage hour division of the Department of Labor got into this. They issued a field assistance bulletin in December 2020, and uh, we're addressing the use of telemedicine in establishing, quote, serious health condition under the Family Medical Leave Act. So traditionally under the FMLA, a serious health condition required either inpatient care, such as staying overnight in a hospital, or, quote, continuing treatment by a health care provider. And treatment had been defined under the FMLA to include examinations to determine if a serious health condition existed and evaluations of the condition. Now, the issue presented was whether, with the growing rise of telemedicine, some type of telemedicine consultation would qualify to, such that you would uh, be able to qualify for FMLA coverage under the definition that it existed. So we've got this new guidance from the Wage Hour Division that, given that COVID-19 has occurred, the Wage Hour Division will consider telemedicine to be an in-person visit under the FMLA, provided the three factors are met. Number one, it includes um, an examination, evaluation, or a treatment by a healthcare provider. Number two, it's permitted and accepted by state licensing authorities. And number three, generally is performed by video conference. So that's what they want to see in terms of the factors to establish that it qualifies under the FMLA. And then they gave a little bit more guidance to say that they do not think that a simple telephone call, a letter, an email, or a text message by themselves will be enough to satisfy the test of an in-person visit. But those tests sound like they are, in fact, pretty sort of 
pandemic agnostic and maybe could continue has the has the wage and hour division set a timeline on on the end of using telemedicine under these three factors or is it an indefinite standard now they're not clear that it's going to only be related to COVID-19 so I think that Going forward, this guidance will be in place and can be used even if, for example, COVID-19 numbers start to go down in 2021 with the vaccinations. I think that this guidance will still be there and something for employers to use as sort of a guidepost and lesson until it's withdrawn or, or revisited by the WHD. It's been a really interesting conversation, Spencer, because so many of the topics that you've educated us on sort of developed out of the COVID environment in 2020 really have bled into, and it looks like they will continue throughout 2021. Are there any other developments that you'd like to share as we wind up? We've now been about a year into the pandemic. It's a good time to assess how how did it go over the past year? What were the successes? What were the areas that needed improvement? Do policies need to be revised or revisited? Does training need to be refreshed? Are there lessons learned? Can you sit down with your managers and talk about struggles that they may have had in dealing with these things? And how can you calibrate so that going forward, you learn from anything and, and improve? Hopefully the numbers will continue to go down as we move into 2021 and the vaccinations start to roll out. But uh, that doesn't mean we're, we're at the end here. I mean, we're going to continue to see these kind of issues. And I will say that as employees start to return to the workplace in 2021, which is likely once the vaccines are rolled out, then you're going to see an increase in these kind, these very kinds of things we've been talking about, the screening issues, the vaccination related issues, the workplace safety the, and the retaliation issues as well. So this is a time to sort of take stock a year in and make any necessary changes sort of as we await the employees returning to work that have been out for a while. Well, Spencer, thank you so much for sharing your expertise and your experience over this really interesting and challenging time in identifying these trends that um, we hope will be really helpful and informative to our clients in the employment space and the healthcare space as we move forward into next year. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Jackie. Thanks again for listening to Triage. Timely Conversations for Healthcare Professionals. New episodes are available for download through Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and Spotify. By subscribing to Triage, you will receive timely notifications for each new episode. Also, if you have any topics you would like to hear discussed on Triage, please don't hesitate to email triagesupport at klgates.com. We would love to hear from you.